White gold, the British colonists called it. Precious crystals that added a touch of sweetness to a rough and tumble life. As settlers moved west, they took a desire for sugar with them. But because most sugar was extracted from tropical sugar cane, it was expensive and hard to get. In the 1850s, Brigham Young, desiring to create total self-sufficiency in Deseret, promoted the making of sugar from sugar beets, a process developed in 18th century Germany. But the actual methods were not well understood, and early attempts in Utah did not result in sugar. All that changed, however, when newer methods using lime for getting beet sugar led to the establishment of the Lehigh Sugar Factory in 1891. It would kick off an industry that at its height ranked third in the state in terms of economic impact. Sugar production and its related industries became especially important in Cache Valley and had a particular impact on the town of Providence. Beets became a popular crop among Providence farmers, but even more important was the quarrying in Providence Canyon of the limestone necessary for the sugar making process. Together, these industries account for a vital chapter in Providence history. Providence had been settled in 1859 along the banks of Spring Creek. It received its name from the LDS apostles Orson Hyde and Ezra T. Benson, who visited it shortly after settlement and thought it somewhat of a providential place. Nestled in the shadows of the mountains, christened Little Baldy, Big Baldy, Temple Baldy, and others, it grew up on the east side of the valley, populated by hard-working, hardy folks of English, Swiss, and German descent. By the early 1900s, it had a population of about 900, most engaged in dry farming, fruit growing, raising cattle, and other agricultural endeavors. So beets become a, a very big uh, item to all the farmers here in, in uh, Providence. And uh, a lot of them, all the farmers, are talking their interconnects, uh, Alders, Furmans, Zollingers, but any farmer had beets as a cash crop. So he had some money coming in. This uh, was a big thing for them because they got uh, the use of the tops to feed their cattle and the beets they sold and, and made money off of it. Growing sugar beets was not an easy job. It required back-breaking thinning in the spring, tedious weeding in the summer, and topping off the greens by hand at harvest time. Most of these tasks were done by crews of young boys and girls. First thing, after they planted them, they had to make sure they, they got them planted so they wouldn't freeze. Then at the end of school, when it was out, uh, they would hire the young people and all those that wanted to work to go in to uh, thin the beets. Uh, the beets was planted in rows uh, just like you do the grain. And uh, you'd go down and make them sure they was about eight inches, six to eight inches apart so you'd get the big beet and get some growth in it. And uh, the short hoe was so you'd bend over and picking the doubles, what we called doubles, where there was more than one. If you was real accurate, you could chop them sometimes to where there was just one beat, but you had to just have one. If you left two, you got in trouble. So we tried to do what was right. Uh, our backs would really give us a fit, so we would crawl on our knees if we could. And it seemed like those rolls were so long and the sun was so hot that uh, we, we were okay. The end of the school year brought with it a certain knowledge that the sugar beets had to be thinned. 
If there was ever anything which made a student want to stay in school, it was that certainty. Historian A.J. Simmons. Thinning beets was a backbreaker, and anybody that did it would tell you that. If you made it to the end of the rows one time, they was a block, a block and a half long, you just lay down and moan because your back hurt so bad. And then when you got a little better, you'd get back up and head down the row again. You had so many you were supposed to do each day, and you tried to meet that quota. We went to work at 8 in the morning. We uh, went home for lunch at noon and back in the fields until about 6 o'clock. At least once uh, you would be hired by them to go and hoe, and you could use a long-handled hoe for that because uh, the weeds and that, uh, they were maybe close to the beets, but uh, you would get most of them with a long-handled hoe so you didn't have to bend over. The beet harvest was so important that most schools let kids out for a couple of days of beet vacation in late October. It might have been a vacation for those whose fathers didn't raise sugar beets, but for the rest of us, it was no vacation at all. A.J. Simmons. Then when it got to the fall and the two-week beet vacation, it wasn't a vacation for us, but... <laughs> And sometimes, you know, the weather was bad. You had the rain, the snow, and the, it was cold and, and uh, not very enjoyable to be out. We did uh, love it when we had a good fall. When beets were harvested, they were taken to the sugar factory where they were thinly sliced and boiled down to create a sweet juice. The pulp was used for cattle feed. The juice was mixed with a milk of lime created from limestone that was slaked into a liquid solution. The mixture was then cooked into a syrup. When it reached the right consistency, the syrup was separated through flotation and filtering to remove all the lime and impurities. And then through a Stefan's operation, that's where the lime comes in. So you'd haul the lime rock, they would put it in the lime kiln and fire it and get the nice white powdery lime and somehow use that in the operation to float the impurities out of the sugar. The remaining crystals were run through a process called spinners to separate the dark molasses from the pure sugar. You'd uh, top them off and throw the beets in a pile and the beet uh, tops would be in a row and the beets would be in a row. And uh, that was a lot of work too because you just bend over and you have to dig them out and hold them up and chop them off. Some of those beets is eight to uh, maybe 12 pounds of beet. And uh, if you couldn't hold them, you'd put them over your knee and hope you didn't whack your leg and maybe hold them up this way and chop them that way. And, but uh, it was work. It was a lot of work. At first, beets were shipped to sugar factories in Ogden and other parts of the state. But by 1900, beets were so plentiful in Cache Valley that there was a push for a local factory. The first factory, the Logan Factory, opened in 1901 west of Providence in the confluence of the Blacksmith Fork and Logan Rivers. By 1910, it was processing 60,000 tons of beets a year. Over the years, 150 or so Providence residents were employed at the factory, where they were paid 15 cents an hour. At the height of sugar production, there were four factories in Cache Valley. In addition to the Logan factory, plants in Lewiston, Cornish, and Smithfield Amalga joined with one in Whitney, Idaho to form the Amalgamated Sugar Company. And we would throw the beets up into the wagon. And usually one beet would get thrown too fast and go over to the other side and you'd hear a loud yell because someone got hit on the head. And sometimes it's started a fight, and <laughs> but it was soon stopped because we had to work. <laughs> but, uh, you know, sometimes you had to do a few things to have fun. You had to have the point sharp, and so you'd sharpen it uh, every other day or every day to make sure it's sharp, you'd cut through and, and then hook the beats with this thing. And if uh, sometimes when you was uh, cutting them off the side, you, you might hook your knee or your <laughs> lower leg and it dig in a little bit but uh, then of course the Levi's was very important you had to have your handle <laughs> so it wouldn't slip off when you're swinging 
and cutting the beets. And uh, there you are, this is uh, my knife that I kept around and still have it today of, of the beet harvest. The citizens of Providence had long looked to the nearby mountains for water, timber, rock, fish, and game. Around the turn of the century, prospectors also began to look for minerals such as lead and zinc. In 1903, Elias Peter Hansen found a bed of high-grade limestone located about six miles up Providence Canyon, filed a claim, and contracted with the Amalgamated Sugar Company to supply lime for sugar beet processing. The rock was broken up in one-man maximum pieces, the size one man could load on a wagon, then was piled on flatbed wagons and hauled to the sugar factory west of town, where it was again broken up into usable sizes. But because this left a lot of waste at the factory, the company began to require the rock to be brought down in about eight-inch pieces, which were loaded into deep wagons which could carry about five tons at a time. A round trip from the quarry to the factory and back could take anywhere from 8 to 12 hours. The limestone sold for $1.35 a ton. Haulers were paid $1.15 a ton, which meant they could make about $5.75 a day, which was good money in those days. Between 1903 and 1904, some 3,000 tons of rock were hauled from the quarry. The wagons were mostly uh, mostly owned by the farmers. They owned the horses. Had, uh, Providence just had beautiful horses. They had perched in all the big draft animals for the quarry. And they used to have their pulling contests over at the county for that reason. And the, the uh, animals were just, just huge and just beautiful animals. Cause they'd call 14 ton out of the, there. And the, the local people, the men that didn't have farms in the town, or didn't have full time working on the farms. They would rent the the horses from the farmers, and they they normally get the horses and the wagon for three and a half dollars a day, and then they would go up to the quarry and they would quite often leave at two or three o'clock in the morning to get up to the quarry and get their load of rock. They'd be back out by by noon or around noon time, and then the horses, of course, would be turned back to farmers, and the horses would go to work for the rest of the day on the farms. In 1922, Frank Kelly took over management of the quarry, a position he held for many years. By this time, some 70 to 80 men were employed at the quarry, and cabins were built to house about 50 workers at the site. And then in the 30s, during the Depression years and that, we lived at the quarry. Uh, we had a camp up there. We had our cabin, which was our home that we lived in. We had two bunk houses, each of them holding about 12 men. And then we had the kitchen and the big dining area. And of course, below that, where the wind blew the right way, we had all the horses and the mules down there that worked in the quarry. And uh, that was our, our camp that we had. And it was within walking distance of the quarry. The men would, would walk up to the quarry from there. Frank's wife, Clara, brought their young family to live in a cabin there, where she also cooked for the workers. It made Providence different than the other little towns in the valley because the quarry was something unusual and it was a, a, another income that all of the men had. And it started as soon as we could get the roads cleared in May, uh, snow, and would run uh, through the end of September, uh, depending on the weather, of course. Looking back, many people considered the time from the early 1920s to about 1935 the golden years of the quarry. But times were changing. The wagging haulers were growing increasingly unhappy with their wages and threatened to quit in order to force the company to raise their pay. Frank Norberg, who was then operating the quarry, called a bluff and brought in five red Ford trucks to replace the wagons. A 1936 Ford truck cost $200. Trucks could make the trip to the railroad in an hour and 15 minutes instead of taking all day. The sugar company also did a major overhaul of quarry equipment, upgrading the entire operation with modern equipment for handling the rock and air-operated drills for preparing holes for blasting. 
So that time they put the trucks in, and they're beautiful red Ford trucks. I can still remember them. And uh, they used to go up and pass the street out here, just one block away from where I lived. And they'd go up the Dugway, and they'd make a trip about every hour and a half. We would run down on the corner of 4th South and watch them as they'd go by one by one, about 10, 15 minutes behind each other. And, and there was a guy on the truck by the name of Mark Mert Matthews. And Mert used to wave to us. I saw he had his smoking cigar out there, and he was just having a time. But, and Mert Mer started throwing us a piece of candy. And we got so close to him that uh, one day he said, uh, would you like a ride? And so three of our little boys, 10 years old, jumped in that truck. And he says, where are you going? He said, oh, we're just out for a walk. And he says, I'll take you halfway and let you out, and then I'll give you a ride back. That was the beginning of my experience with the quarry. The Grand Johnson Construction Company took over the operation of the quarry in 1945 and brought in a fleet of World War II surplus Burma trucks to haul the limestone. More efficient methods were also adopted to increase production. Born and raised in Providence, and I lived a half a block away from the road where the quarry trucks came down out of the quarry. So as a little boy, I spent a lot of time over on the corner waving to the drivers of those great big trucks as they came down the road with, with lime rock on. The year I graduated from high school, I was lucky enough to get a job. Lee Jorgensen was the superintendent in the quarry, and he hired me, and I began driving what we call the old Burma Specials, the old K-11 Army Surplus Internationals out of the quarry. There were nine, usually nine trucks hauling out of the road, on the road to the, to the railroad cars and three or four up in the quarry hauling from the shovel to the crushers. I worked there during the summers for four summers, uh, 61 through 65. And um, I was uh, just out of high school, was going to school, and there was a summer job. LeGrand Johnson supported a lot of students uh, by providing summer work for them at the quarry and at other facilities that he had. Mainly I uh, drove truck in the quarry itself from the shovel down to the crusher. And during the four years I was there, my dad also worked there during the summer months. And uh, he taught me how to operate the shovel and the last year I was there, I was uh, operated the shovel quite a bit. In June of 1946, what has become known as the Big Blast took place. Intended to bring down rock for the entire season, it used 28 tons of dynamite, which had been shipped in two large freight cars. The powder was placed in various tunnels or coyote holes drilled by the workers and set off on Saturday, June 29th. It brought down 125,000 tons of rock in a single blast. The rock crews that we had would would carry, and I worked for them for for when I when I was older, and and we'd we'd carry a, a, a box of which was 50 pound box of line of uh, dynamite in a burlap sack over our shoulder and climb up the cliffs with it or we could carry three cans of black powder, which was usually about 30 pounds to a can. They would uh, drill a hole, and they'd drill down to usually 20 feet for the ma major blast. And then when the hole was drilled, you would drop a uh, one stuck of dynamite down in, light it, and that made a uh, hole in there uh, that, that you could get more in. And then you'd, you'd, and they called it springing. You'd spring the hole. Then you take put, put down two or three sticks of dynamite to make a bigger bigger hole down there, and then you drop in your cans of black powder, which was usually three or four cans of black powder, and that of course was what ignited the, the blast, and it, it could come down. And, and one one blast would be several train car loads of, of rock. Eventually, this type of blasting was considered too dangerous and work shifted to a terrace or benching technique similar to that used in the Kennecott mine in Bingham Canyon. It was interesting because the trucks did not have safety brakes on at that time. They did a little later. But as we'd start down, we would be in the lowest gear we had, first gear. We'd come down the area of the canyon called the steeps. 
and then we get down a little farther and sh shift up into second gear and go down and pass an area called Billy's Camp. And then we can make it up into third gear as we got down to the springs. And then we come along the area and get even to fourth gear as we came across Booty's Roll-Off. Well, Booty's Roll-Off was Booty Naylor who rolled his, his wagon off the deal and it rolled. I think he lost a couple of horses on it too, but uh, that forevermore was Booty's Roll-Off. And then we come to Latham Dugway, shift down again. Latham's flat, shift up again. Tires Dugway, shift down again. Tires flat, shift up again. Down across the cattle guard. The highest gear, we only had a five gear transmission. And when we got down to the flat on the, dug, on the bench, we could get as high as fourth gear. Then we'd shift down again to come down the road to second west in Providence. And in those days, we drove as far north as the Providence Lane, over where the Johnson baseball diamond is now. And then we'd drive down the Providence Lane to the Highway 89, 91, and turn down the highway and go down to where the old sugar factory was to dump the rock into the railroad cars. Querying limestone was hard, rough, dirty, and dangerous work. As one old timer noted, if you wanted to know whether a man has worked at the quarry, just feel his shin bones. And if they're full of nicks, you know he's spent time there. A lot of people were hurt there. I got a foot smashed when I was in high school and ended up in the hospital for a couple of weeks. Slowed down my football career to some extent, but that's the way the quarry was. It wasn't, a, wasn't an easy place you're dealing with dynamite and black powder and sledgehammers and <laughs> all those things that get, and, and trucks. A lot of the trucks get out of control. They're coming down with a big load. And uh, this one day my brother and I were just here from the service. He was looking for work and he thought maybe we could get him to drive that and so he got on the truck and went with me and we drove up and loaded up and was coming down the canyon and he said, this is a piece of cake. He said, I think I'd like to do that. I thought I'd better show him what really happens. It happened to every truck many times. Every now and then those big trucks would jump out of gear. And I picked a spot just right where it was pretty steep and I just kicked it out of gear. He didn't know that. That truck literally lunged about 20 feet down the road. It took me about a half mile to get under control and we came on back down and I pulled down where I picked him up and he said, I believe I want to get out. That was the end of his trucking experience, but it was a kind of a hazardous ride. Two or three of the trucks tipped over. They had brake problems. They had uh, a lot of problems keeping them running. Over the years, there were several serious accidents. In October 1916, a charge of dynamite knocked Jacob Cutterer off a cliff, and he died from the fall. On August 10th, 1917, Philip Stricker died in the same way. Quarry workers found to their dismay that rocks sometimes had a mind of their own. On July 17, 1930, a charge of powder was set and men and teams moved a safe distance. But for some unexplained reason, instead of blowing the ledge to the south as it was intended, it blew west, showering the entire quarry with rocks. 11-year-old Joe Naylor, who had climbed to the top of a large rock to watch the blast, fell as he tried to dodge the falling rock and died of a broken neck. William Bud Kendrick, then 23, was standing with the horses when a small rock hit him in the chest and punctured a lung. He died three days later. We loved it up there. I had my brothers there. We had. Uh, a lot of uh, wild animals there. The deer used to be all around the place. We had a black bear that was up on the lead, uh, ridge that had cubs, and we went up and threw bread to them all the time. And we always thought that, told them they were getting manna from heaven, you know, because we didn't gar dare get close to them, but we <laughs> threw the bread. Uh, my dad would have uh, the uh, people from town come up once a year, and they'd have a big party for everybody, and it was uh, the best. It was always steak and potatoes and everything. and. We'd go out and uh, gather pine boughs to decorate the whole uh, the hall that we had for the for the men, and they would come up. And of course, in those days, they they loved to sing. And after they would eat, the men would all go outside and sing. And they had all the old songs, you know, that Swanee River and all of those that you know we haven't heard for a few years. 
As the truck drivers from, that drove to the sugar factory would make their pickups, some of them would come up to the little shack we had for a, kind of a rest or a break. And uh, we took this dead rattlesnake and put in the trail where they used to come up, jump over the conveyor belt onto this trail to make it up to this little shack. And we put this dead rattlesnake there all coiled up. And several of the truck drivers, they come up and some of them down there took a turn around and mid-air to head back down the trail. <laughs> Over time, beet production and the quarry were important to the Providence economy, not only themselves, but also in supporting other industries. In the early years, several blacksmiths were kept busy repairing rock wagons. The whole thing was a horse killer and a wagon smasher. The only ones who made any money off the quarry were the blacksmiths who fixed our wagons. Billy Checkets, quarry worker. Providence became known for the quality of its draft horses. Local merchants, such as the Tire Brothers, were able to support a mercantile store. And even during the Great Depression, workers were able to support their families. However, increased competition from other sugar sources and declining beet production began to take their toll. In the late 1970s, the sugar making process had left Cache Valley and no sugar beets were grown. By 1980, there were no sugar factories left in Utah. The quarry continued in production for a few years, but increased concerns over safety, noise, and quality of the watershed in the canyon signaled a change in attitude and conditions. In 1986, work stopped and the canyon fell silent. so glad to get back to school. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was hard on your back. Uh, it was a lot of work. And uh, my mother used to say, oh, I feel so sorry for you girls out there on those beats and, and that. But, you know, that was what we had to do. It wasn't unusual, at about four o'clock in the afternoon, the kids say, Dad, it's time for a break. We get in our Jeep and we go to the quarry. We pull out the waterfall, and if you haven't been there, I'll take you. But to go out that waterfall and sit there and have root beer and roast hot dogs and just enjoy an evening together, take the 22 and let the kids shoot. Uh, those are items the kids will remember. And I'll bet, there isn't a, I'll bet there isn't a week went by, all those summers when we raised our family here, that we didn't go to the quarry. For us young people, they were fun. There were two or three of them that ha they were open air. Two or three of them would had a canvas top just to shade you. And so you're out in the wide open air. You could lay the windshield down in front if you want. Most of us didn't. We wanted a little protection. But the wind would blow and dust and whatever else. But so what? We were driving a truck and getting paid for it. Most of the men would sit and talk and sing a lot of songs and I learned a lot of songs from them and when I started, got into grade school, the teacher asked me to sing a song and I sung, sang a song and it wasn't a very good song because I'd learned it from those up there so I got in trouble with my parents but I thought it was, I didn't see anything wrong with it. <laughs> Hard work and sacrifice, determination and perseverance, a desire to make life a little sweeter, a little better for themselves and for future generations. That's the story of limestone and sugar beets in Providence. <laughs>